Hey, thanks for watching today. I'm Brother James, and I greet you once again in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. We are studying the Bible book of Revelation, uh, verse by verse, uh, sometimes line by line, and even word by word. We have come to Revelation chapter 3 and verse number 10. We are studying the letter written by the Holy Spirit using the pen of John the Apostle to a real church in the city of Philadelphia in Asia Minor almost 2,000 years ago. This letter applies to all of the churches in the world today because the Holy Spirit said at the close of this letter, and he's very, very clear about it, uh, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. So all the churches need what God had to say to this church. In verse number 8, uh, or 7 for the context, uh, to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth that no man openeth. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, no man can shut it, for thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not despised my name. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee, because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I will also keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Now, they kept God's word, so God promised he would keep them. That's a blessing. Between the patient waiting and the reigning with Christ, there has to come the hour of temptation which shall come upon all the world. Here we are taught that the saints will be kept not from temptation. Everybody's tempted. Everybody experiences temptations. But from this hour, this hour comes not upon an individual believer, not upon a congregation, a, a local church, not upon the church, this hour comes upon the world, all the world. First John says, love not to the believer, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world, for all that is in the flesh, uh, in the world, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world, and you're not the world. So, why, why any Christian would be concerned or confused about the hour of temptation which shall come upon all the world, why you would be concerned about that when you are not part of the world just shows that somebody's not been reading their Bible, but they've been listening to someone tell them something that is supposedly in the Bible, but it's not. The Hour of Temptation, uh, Isaiah 43, verse tw 2 is a good cross-reference there. Isaiah 43 and verse number 2, When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee, and through the rivers they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned, neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. And someone says, see, see, we're going through the waters. Well, we, yeah, we, we, we have some times like that in our life, uh, but uh, they're not going to overflow us. We go through the rivers, he'll be with us, and through the fire, and, and not be burned, and, and, and so forth. But verse 1 says, But now thus saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, that's not me, that's not the church. He that formed thee, O Jacob, and he that formed thee, O Israel, I'm not a flesh and blood descendant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I'm a born-again child of God. 
Fear not, for I have redeemed thee. I have called thee by thy name. Thou art mine. Those things are true of Christians and of the nation. Verse 3, For I am the Lord thy God, the Holy One of Israel, thy Savior. I gave Egypt for thy ransom, Ethiopia and Seba for thee. <clears throat> I've been redeemed, not by Egypt. I've been redeemed, not by Ethiopia. God didn't give Seba for my redemption. Anybody that tries to make Israel and the church the same doesn't even understand redemption. They were bought out of bondage and delivered to be God's earthly people. I was bought out of sin and delivered to be a child of God. My redemption price was the blood of Jesus Christ, not the destruction of three nations. Huge difference. So we're working our way toward this, this hour that shall come. In Mark 13, Mark chapter 13 and verse 20, Mark 13, 20, Uh, the Bible says here uh, in verse uh, 19, For in those days shall be affliction such as was not from the beginning of the creation which God created unto this time neither shall be. So this, this is the worst it, it, it will ever be. Nothing before it, nothing after it will ever be this bad. Except the Lord had shortened those days, no flesh should be saved. But for the elect's sake, whom he had chosen, he has shortened the days. So God, uh, during this time period, when Satan makes an all-out attempt to exterminate the nation of Israel, this generation, Matthew 24, uh, God will shorten those days so that some flesh of persecuted people can be saved. I have no, no hope whatsoever that my flesh will be saved. My soul is saved. And one day I'll be absent from the body and present with the Lord. I'll be saved while worms eat my flesh. I have, I have no hope that my flesh will be saved alive. My flesh is going into a hole in the ground, but I'm saved. So many of these passages in Revelation and, and the other prophetic works talk about people being saved alive, not dying, their flesh being saved during a terrible, terrible time when somebody's trying to kill them. That's a whole different matter than Christian people uh, to whom the Lord said, eh, fear not them that can kill the body and after can do nothing. Don't, don't, don't worry about it. Because we're not trying to stay alive to get into an earthly kingdom. The sooner we die, the sooner we're absent from the body and present with the Lord. Whole different situation. Anyway, we got to get back to Revelation 3. We'll, we'll talk about all of that uh, in, in so much detail, uh, you, you, won't, you won't even have the time to follow all of it. But, but we'll get to it, but not just yet. So he says, I come quickly. I come quickly. Behold, verse 11, behold, I come quickly. To the dead church at Sardis, the promise of the Lord's coming was stated with a threat of judgment. To the faithful church at Philadelphia, the Lord's coming is a blessed promise of deliverance. Entirely different. Hold fast that which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. So what did they do? They kept the word. They kept Jesus' name. What did he tell them to do? Don't, don't, you've held it this long. Don't let it go now. You've held true thus far. Let's finish well. It implies an all-out attempt will be made to wrest the Word of God and true profession of Christ from the Philadelphia church. The best of saints are as subject to defeat as are the most lowly. And the third lesson, decline is natural. Carelessness breeds ruin no matter how well or how long one has stood for the truth. Philadelphia is a great church. The people in that church have a great testimony, but they could lose that testimony and that church could be, could be destroyed, 
come to naught, fade away, deteriorate, just as surely as the other seven. In fact, the Laodicean church that we'll get to in, in, in just a little while, nothing, nothing much good said about it. And it, it eventually, the Lord put out its candlestick, it's gone. The church at Smyrna, the church at Ephesus, some good things, some bad things, gone. This church at Philadelphia, it's a great church. The Lord has some great things to say about it. And within the same time frame as the other six churches ceased to be, that Philadelphia church ceased to be. If you're in a good church right now, my friend, you better do everything you can to make sure it's a good church tomorrow. It won't stay that way on its own. Everything, everything works its way downward unless it's repaired, maintained, built back up. Let's, let's stay busy. Let's, let's don't start coasting. Thy crown, thy crown. Those at Smyrna were to be faithful unto death that they might receive a martyr's crown, chapter 2 and verse 10. Those at Philadelphia had already earned the crown of rejoicing and were told to stay true to the Lord that they lose not this reward. You can't lose what God has done for you, salvation of your soul. But you can lose the reward of what you have done for God. Uh, not today, but, but in some future lesson, we'll talk about that in some detail. Now, he says in chapter 3, verse 12, him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God and he shall go no more out. And I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. That is, that's a lot of promise, many promises. First of all, a pillar. Some men stood so tall and strong for the faith that they were considered pillars on earth in the local church. Galatians 2.9 speaks of men that were pillars in the church. Here we learn that such steadfastness will be rewarded with prominence in the new Jerusalem. Everybody that goes to heaven is saved forever. Everybody that goes to heaven doesn't get the same eternal reward. The Philadelphia believers had but little strength but God has long used the weak to confound the strong, and he will make them temple pillars, interesting, a, a symbol of unmoving strength and, and stability. That's the picture of these Christians who weren't strong but were strong. Philadelphia was a famous center of heathen worship. Not unnaturally, its principal god was Dionysus, the god of wine. Since the grape gave Philadelphia so much of its prosperity, it was natural that the Philadelphians should worship the god of the grape. But Philadelphia had so many gods and so many temples that sometimes men called it Little Athens. To walk through the temple-lined streets was to re be reminded of the center of the worship of the Olympian gods. Philadelphia had a custom regarding these temples. When a man served the state well, when he had left behind him a noble record as a magistrate or as a public benefactor or as a priest, the memorial which the city gave to him was to erect a pillar in one of the temples with his name inscribed upon it. Philadelphia honored its illustrious sons by putting their names on the pillars of its temples so that all who came to worship might see and remember. Likewise, the risen Christ promises an honor to his own that they will be made a pillar 
in the very temple of the one true and living God. Isn't that amazing? That God would bestow an honor like that on sinners saved by grace? But there it is. He also says that they will go no more out. The city of Philadelphia was in a region visited by earthquakes, often earthquakes. In AD 17, a great, uh, a great quake, <laughs> great quake, not great cake, <laughs> a great, <laughs> every time I try to say it, I, I buckle up the wrong way. A great earthquake, there we go, let's separate them. A great earthquake destroyed 12 cities of the Lydian Valley including Sardis and Philadelphia. When the great quake came, how about that? The great quake came. Many of the inhabitants went outside the city to dwell, while those who remained in the city and patched up houses lived in constant dread of a recurrence of the shocks. This is according to the historian Strabo, uh, who wrote in AD 20, this makes two of the promises of the saints here most interesting. Go out no more, meaning there won't be any more earthquakes, no more destruction, no more uh, buildings falling down, death, crying, loss, uh, financial setback. All that will be over when you get to heaven. You'll get to settle down and live in peace and safety from that time forward. So the pillars... Speak of what was great about the city. The no more going out speaks about what was fearful and, and troublesome about the city. And both carry over into the eternal promises to the uh, Christian that overcomes. Verse 12, New Jerusalem which cometh down out of heaven. Out of heaven. Heaven is mentioned 56 times. In Revelation, it's plural form only in Revelation 12, 12. Then he says, I will uh, write upon him the name of my God, and I will write upon him my new name. The very things which brought prosperity to Philadelphia also brought danger. Because it was on the edge of this volcanic area, as we said, it was greatly vulnerable to earthquakes like the great quake of 17 AD, which uh, laid waste the city. Tiberius, the Roman emperor, remitted its taxes and gave it a very large contribution toward the task of rebuilding itself. In gratitude, Philadelphia changed its name to Neo Caesarea, New Caesar Town, meaning as we said, the new town of Caesar. The promise of the risen Christ to the overcomer is, I will write, up, write upon him my new name. In gratitude for rebuilding our ruined lives and for bearing all the costs thereof himself, we gladly change our names from whatever our boast might have been to Christian, Christian. Why do we bear the name Christian? Why do we bear the name of Christ? Because our ruined lives were rebuilt at his expense. Praise the Lord. We have in 312 the expression, my God, the name of my God, the city of my God, out of heaven from my God. And a fourth time in this, in this verse, the temple of my God. Four times the Son refers to the Father as His God. He only adopts this language on three occasions. Stay with me. He only adopts this language on three occasions. When He was made sin for us on the cross. Matthew 27, 46, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? The second time, just after the resurrection, 
speaking of his ascension to sit on the throne at the right hand of the Father, he says, I ascend to my God and to your God. And here, in the context of the New Jerusalem. Now, now follow. In the first instance, we understand that Jesus has so fully taken the sinner's place that he has cut off, Daniel 9, 26, Messiah cut off at Calvary in death from the Father, Psalm 22, 1, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? So he takes our place in death and he's cut off and separated from from. And so he says, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That's the humanity of Christ in your place, in my place. In the second, he's the firstborn among many brethren. Having died as a man and risen as a man, he is now ascended as a man. 1 Timothy 2, 5, there is one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus, and he did this to open up the new and living way to the throne of grace. So he dies as a man. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He ascends to heaven as a man. I ascend to my God and to your God. In the third case, the best I can discern, he is so pleased with the condition of the church at Philadelphia and that they are so complete a manifestation of his person, that he associates himself with them in their labor and their hope and their reward. The writer of the Hebrews quotes the words of Christ when he said of the Father, I will put my trust in him, showing that both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will put my trust in him. That's Hebrews 2, verses 11 to 13. So, when stating that the believer may know God's power in quickening him together with Christ, the apostle offered this prayer. To the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, Ephesians 1, 7. So it seems the, the peculiar emphasis given here to the words, my God, marks Christ's humanity and his identification with these believers. And if so, that is some statement of, of respect and gratitude from the Lord to this church. He also makes reference to uh, New Jerusalem. Do you see it there? Uh, this, the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem. That's not the earthly city, not according to the book of Hebrews. It's evident that this is not the rebuilt city on earth because it cometh down out of heaven. Did, we read that. It's not man rebuilding the, the place over there uh, between the Mediterranean and the Jordan. This is not a spiritual enlightening or any other such denial of the literal wording. That's made clear in Revelation 21 and 22 where the city is described, streets, walls, gates, throne, lights, everything about it is, is set forth. The Lord went to prepare a place for those who would believe on his name. But the city was already in existence, complete with mansions, John 14, 2. In my Father's house are many mansions. Psalm 48, the new Jerusalem, which is above, Mount, uh, heavenly Mount Zion, it's already there. And Hebrews 12, 22 to 24 tells us, but ye are come unto, unto Mount Zion, unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect, and to Jesus, 
the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. So there's an earthly Jerusalem and a heavenly Jerusalem. The rewards for faithful citizens of the nation of Israel have to do with that earthly city of Jerusalem. The rewards for the born-again child of God who faithfully serves the Lord Jesus Christ are rewards in the heavenly Jerusalem. So let's wrap up. In the epistle to the church at Philadelphia, we have six points of commendation. One, their works. Two, their little strength. Three, they kept God's word. Four, they did not deny his name. All of those in verse eight. Five, their patience, verse 10. And six, they had earned a crown, verse 11. There are eight revelations of Jesus Christ here. He is holy, he is true, he has the key of David, he opens and shuts and man cannot stay his hand, all of those in verse seven. Number five, he puts down the enemies of his church. He makes his love manifest to all, both of those in verse nine. Number seven, he keeps his church from great tribulation, verse 10. And number 12, he gives eternal rewards. Now, after each of these uh, six letters, we have talked about problems in those churches that are problems in today's churches. And we don't have any such warning in this letter. The church that most fully obeyed the Lord received the fullest revelation of his person. Eight things we're told about Christ in connection with this church. So what would the Spirit say to our church, the one I'm a part of, the one you're a part of, as we read this uh, letter to the Philadelphia church? He would say, be like this one. Be like this one. Praise the Lord. Well, this is kind of a lengthy segment. Uh, let's wrap it up by reminding you that uh, all of these studies that, God willing, we will uh, be recording for you are based upon this, uh, this large work of 600 plus pages, a Christ-honoring commentary on the book of Revelation. This and all of our other books, all of our other teaching materials are available to you at our website, jameswnox.org. Please don't forget to subscribe to this chapter. I'm told that's important, so thanks for doing that. And please, don't, uh, please do help us by letting others know that they can come and learn the Bible, learn the Word of God from someone who believes it right here on this YouTube channel. So till next time, I'm Brother James. May the Lord richly bless you and good day.